remember both parts of a two-part question. So you should always ask a one-part question. When you're giving a talk, it's a, answering questions. It's almost impossible. Uh, you can only remember one thing at a time. OK, um, yeah, so I'm happy to be able to introduce uh, my colleague, Luke Bourne, um, who had got his PhD in statistics from UBC, University of British Columbia, and then uh, came here to our statistics department. And he's been doing a lot of cool things with environmental and spatial data and, and basketball data that he's going to tell us about now. So, Thanks, welcome, Joe. Luke. All right, thanks for the invitation to be here. I, uh, I came to Harvard uh, a little under two years ago, and when I arrived here, I, uh, one of the first questions that, that came to me was, there's a guy that's uh, doing graphics for the New York Times, and he has about a few hundred gigabytes of basketball data. Do you want to work with him? It was a, it was, my response didn't take long, um, and so now, almost two years later, uh, I'm leading a research group uh, working on this data, which I'll describe to you in a minute. And we're looking at sort of uh, solving unique questions with, the, with this data. And I particularly wanted to plug the students working in the group, Alex Franks and Andy Miller, uh, who are gonna, did a lot of the work of that in the first half of the talk, and uh, Dan Cervone and uh, Alex DeMore, who did some of the work in the later part. So the, in the talk, I'm going to talk a bit about the data that we have and, and what the kind of problems we're thinking about. And then I'm going to talk about uh, the two problems. The first I'm going to spend more time on is uh, evaluating uh, defensive characteristics of players. The second is, uh, which I'm going to sort of skip through faster, is uh, instantaneous decision making. So why do we care about uh, basketball? So one of the reasons you might care is to get rich. So in the last uh, couple weeks, uh, uh, Warren Buffett announced that he would give a billion dollars, that's a billion with a B, um, to anyone who predictly, or accurately predicted the uh, NCAA tournament bracket this year. So that's essentially you have to uh, pick uh, uh, 63 events perfectly, and if you work out the odds on that, if you pick randomly, it's about 1 in 9.3 quadrillion. Okay, so I think uh, Warren's money is pretty safe. But if you're not picking games randomly and you can actually estimate the outcomes of basketball games with 80% probability, your odds actually get much, much better. And it works out to about 1 in a million. And so if you do the math, you're ex just, by, just by submitting your, uh, your, your guesses, your expected return is about 1000 bucks, a billion dollars divided by your sort of 1 in a million odds. If you can do better than that and get it to 95%, you have a 1 in 25 chance of getting it right. Your expected reward just by submitting is $45 million. So that's not, that's not saying, okay, you have a low chance of winning. Your, your expected reward is already in the millions of dollars. So there's huge, huge possibility here. I should say that we started working with this data way before this challenge, so we were much more ivory, ivory tower about the whole thing. So what is this data? So for, we have, uh, there's actually data for this year, but um, because we have uh, sort of the whole start to end of the season last year, we're focusing on last year's data. It's actually uh, from 515 games because this, this, these, uh, it's from half of the, the stadiums in the NBA last year. And what we have is we have two D locations uh, for all 10 players and three referees on the court, as well as the 3 D location of the ball 25 times per second for 515 games. That's about 800 million data points and about 200 gigs, okay? In its sort of raw format. And I'm not gonna get it, I'm sort of gonna skip through the, the months and months of work to get it in a usable format, but I'll just leave, you can put your minds to work and imagine that this data was in thousands of XML files of various sorts. And I should also say that it was annotated. So we have um, people that are manually saying, oh, a pass happened at this millisecond and a shot happened at this millisecond, and you can imagine how accurate that is. Not very good, okay? But let me think about the types of, oh, let me actually, maybe I'll, I'll jump to, uh, to an animation here. This is what the, the data looks like. So every, uh, every frame of this video here, I'll refresh it. Every frame of this, so you can see the, uh, uh, the offensive team in red, the defensive team in blue, the ball in yellow, and you can see actually the size of the ball is as he's dribbling, it's getting bigger and smaller. So every frame of this is essentially one line of the data set once you get it in a nice format. Okay, every frame. And so this is the kind of thing that we're seeing. So in, in my PhD, I did a lot of work where we looked at uh, multi-target tracking. So we had multiple ca like cameras, and we're trying to infer uh, for locations. At this point, all of that work's already been done. So there's cameras in the, in the, roof, or the ceilings of these stadiums. Um, and so that work's already been uh, done. And so now we just have the locations. OK. So what are, what are we going to do about this? We thought about all sorts of questions. So when we first started working with the data, 
we just spent like weeks just thinking about what are, what are the kind of questions that we should uh, think about. We know some people at the Boston Celtics, we know some people at the Miami Heat, so we talked to coaches, um, and, and we said, well, what's important? And one of the first things they said was, we have no good metrics to evaluate players defensively. It's easy to see how many points a person scored or how many assists they made, but it's very hard to quantify how good a player is defensively because it's not something immediately observable. In other words, there's no immediate small s statistic to pull out for defense. Okay. So how, how do we actually measure this? And so um, when we started thinking about this, we started thinking, okay, what's the defensive or what's the offensive uh, equivalent? So if we want to evaluate a basketball player defensively, well, first off, how do we actually evaluate them offensively? So uh, uh, my friend Kirk made this plot, and it's a shot chart for Nate Robinson. And so what it essentially shows is so two things. It shows frequency and efficiency. And so frequency is uh, how often and where you shoot from, and efficiency is how good you are, or your field goal percentage in basketball lingo. So what this is saying is that he takes a lot of shots, for uh, three-point shots, so that's outside of the arc, the long-range shots. And he's, he's better from the right side than he is from the left side. Okay? And it also says he's not very good down by the basket. Okay, although he takes a fair bit of shots down there. All right, and, and thankfully it's annotated, so the question that Bonnie had earlier this morning, uh, what, what do I look at? He's telling you on here what to look at, okay? So how do we do this for defense? We, we don't immediately have sort of a notion of, of spatially how, how a player is defensively. So imagine, because we don't directly observe this, we think about uh, sort of the defensive skill as a latent quantity. So how do, we, how do we actually get it out? The sort of simplest model I can think of off the top of my head for doing this is, is to think about the probability of player X taking shot at point Y. So that's the offensive shot chart. Offensive shot chart. That's the, the probability of a player taking a shot at any given point in the court. And the key thing is here now is we're conditioning on being defended by uh, player Z. And so as Joe always says, uh, conditioning is the soul of statistics, right? So, uh, which is also why his hair always looks so lush. But, so the, the key here, <laughs> The key here is that we're defending on who the defender is, so we need to know the characteristics of, of defender Z. Uh, it, it takes all of my Canadianism not to say Z. Um, so we think of it as some function of a, a kappa parameter, and kappa XY, that's saying that this is like offensive parameter of player X at location Y, and the beta parameter is the, what, really what we're interested in. That's the defensive or sort of the inhibition effect of the defender Z at location Y. And then you could also have a team effect there. So I'm not saying not at all what these types of models are. In the end, we sort of do something like just logistic regression. But before we even think about the types of models, there's two big parts missing here. First off, we don't know who's guarding whom. And to say how good a player is uh, defensively, we need to first know who they're, who they're defending. Right? So there's something completely missing there, which is to say, if you want to know if a, a person's good at defending another player, you need to first know who they're, who they're defending against. The second thing is why, which is the spatial uh, reference, is really high dimensional. We don't necessarily care about, um, you know, the data is actually to a hundredth of an inch. Which, uh, which, first off, we don't care about for practical reasons, and second off, I highly doubt it's, it's, it's accurate to that level. So we need, to th we need to think beyond that about what sort of efficient ways to represent the spatial uh, features of the court. So let's get into that. How do, we, how do we address these things? So before we can th even think about the problem, as we've seen in a lot of the talks today, the problem is not the end model. That's like, oh, feed it into LM and R, and you're done. It's getting your, your sort of design matrix, getting the actual data uh, th that you need. And in our case, we have this massive hundreds of gigabytes of data, but the thing that we need just isn't there, and that's who's guarding whom. So here's how we, here's how we think about it. We think about the... Um, as, as, as the defender having some sort of optimal location. So here, if you think of O as the, the person you're guarding, you're the offensive player, H is the hoop, and B is the ball, where the ball is, we imagine that the defender has some optimal location within that triangle, okay? And what we, what we imagine is that uh, somewhere in that triangle is the optimal location. And, and it turns out that if you know that optimal location, uh, then you can actually figure out who's guarding who by just simple sort of HMM tricks, like forwards, backwards, uh, recursions. But obviously, we don't know where the optimal location is. But interestingly, conditional on who's, if you know who's guarding who, you can sort of do a uh, constrained least squares problem to sort of figure out where that, that optimal location is. And then you also can also learn the noise, sort of the distribution around that optimal location. And so if you think, of, so we can actually do this sort of as a, as a, in an EM framework, where the, the EM is essentially optimizing both these things at once. It's getting who's guarding who, uh, and then so it conditions on um, 
optimal location, it figures out uh, our best estimate of who's guarding who, and then conditioned on who's guarding who, we ask, up, update the optimal location. And so this is our sort of basic model. We imagine that this optimal, optimal location is this um, combination of, of the, th the three weights. In other words, it's in this triangle. Um, and when we actually run the EM, this is what we get. So we get uh, a, a, a coefficient of 0.61 on OTK, which is the, offender, uh, the offensive player at time t. Uh, so that means you're sort of mostly towards the person you're guarding. 0.09 towards the ball, so you're hedging a little bit towards the ball and then 0.3 towards the hoop, so you're sort of towards the hoop. So that makes sense, right? So this picture is exactly what that ratio is. And so you, it kind of makes sense, right? You're, you're on your guy, but you're towards the basket, and then you're hedging a little bit towards the ball. So this is, this is and this is fit um, from all of the, uh, the, the data that we have. So what does this actually look like? Um, let me jump back to Safari. So here's the same possession that I showed you before, but now we're showing who's guarding who. So this is the output of the model. So here, what, I've, what I'm drawing here is a line which shows the probability of the defensive player guarding the offensive player. And so you can see at times there's uncertainty. Those lines go gray. And we see switching. There's actually an AR model underneath here that I haven't talked about. Um, so there's sort of an AR model on who's guarding who. There's a, a smoothness. And so you see that it actually does pretty good. There's a lot of switches in this uh, possession. And it turns out that this is the possession in the database with the most switches. So this is like the kind of the craziest possession. I'll show you one more, which is sort of more normal. So it starts off nine and seven there, double teaming. Um, Blair realizes that he's missing his man, goes and covers him, that's nine and zero down by the basket. Uh, passes over to Ellington. There's some uh, movement here. Ellington's got the ball. You can see that there's sort of, sort of crisscrossing going on. Over to uh, Randolph. And you can see that the, even as, as players are crossing over, that it does a pretty good job of, of tracking that. So this is sort of the outcome. This, <laughs> in one plot, I'm showing you months of work here. but. Um, you get the idea that essentially, before we can even do what we really want to do, we had this sort of side project, which is essentially this plot. Okay, so we, we know who's guarding who. The other thing was, how do we think about an actual uh, representation of the court that, that's efficient and captures what we know about basketball players? So let me just show you some shot charts. Now, we, because we only have uh, uh, the data from half the arenas, we don't have it in Miami, for instance, so LeBron doesn't have uh, many, much data in the... In the uh, um, in the data set, but this is the shot chart for, for LeBron. He shoots just about everywhere with the, the majority at the basket. Uh, Steph Curry also shoots from everywhere, but, but we have more data from uh, that team. Steve Novak on the left there is a primarily a three-point specialist. He takes all of his shots, for the most part, from long range. Brooke Lopez, on the other hand, is a big man that just sits under the basket and dunks it, okay? And then on the left, interestingly, is, is James Harden. He has this sort of uh, split personality game where he likes to take three-point shots, but occasionally he also drives to the basket, okay, for easy layup. So uh, he sort of has this interesting game, and then Tony Parker, on the other hand, shoots from everywhere except for three-pointers. He's like, he seems to be scared of the three-point line or something. <laughs> so this is, a, this is a drastically simplified version of, of sort of what we're, the way we thought about this problem, is we were thinking about these... these uh, um, shot charts as Poisson processes. And what a Poisson, or what a Poisson process tells you is essentially that the, it defines the distribution of points over, over a space. And you can imagine that a Poisson process is defined by some sort of intensity function. And the easiest way to think about this is, imagine over the court, or the half court, if, I'll, I'll jump back to the slide for a second. If you imagine that, that where a player shoots lots from, we expect their intensity, that intensity function to be high. That intensity function determines sort of how many points we expect to see in a given point. And we sort of, we model this non-parametrically, but the key point is that we're going to sort of focus on that intensity parameter, which is sort of a smoothed version of, of the shot uh, charts. Because, you know, just because a player sh has taken two shots from this exact inch doesn't mean that he would never take a shot from this inch. Right? So we expect some sort of smoothness over the court. So we actually, lambda, we assume, is a spatial process, and it's actually smooth. It's actually, for the, the technocrats, it's a Gaussian process that we use here. Okay. So here's uh, uh, the, the intensity surface for LeBron James. On the left is the shot chart, the same one you saw before. On the right is the resulting intensity surface. Okay. Now let me show you this, the sim similar thing for Nate Robinson. Okay, it's on a different scale because he shoots less. But you get the idea that there's sort of these underlying intensities which tell you where people shoot from. So what do we want to do here? We have these sort of, imagine now we have for every player, not just the shot chart, but we have this sort of surface over the half court, which sort of says where these players shoot from. So how do we use that to, to create some sort of uh, representation 
that's going to be uh, efficiently characterize the, the court. And the way we do this is we look at the, uh, uh, these intensities, and we think about breaking these intensities up into subcomponents. And we do this in a sort of really clever way that, that allows us to, um, to interpret, to, to sort of take uh, each, each, each of these intensities, break it up into subcomponents such that each subcomponent is also a Poisson process. And so we can think about a generative model for shooting as sort of first pulling from one of the, the subcomponents and then pulling from uh, the distribution on that component. So let me just show you what those components look like. So again, we're essentially taking the intensity surface and we're sort of breaking it down and thinking of each person as a weighted combination of those different subsurfaces. So on the top here, you see what it looks like when we set k equals to 10. It's a little bit hard to see here, but if I sort of along the top here. So you see that the first three on the left are close range shots. Okay. The, um, the next uh, four here are mid range shots. Um, these are sort of ones around foul territory. These are sort of the, from the outer perimeter. And then the last three are three point shots. So these are corner threes. This one's sort of uh, um, from the wing and then out uh, from the top of the arc. So these are sort of the, the resulting bases. So we had these surfaces for every player. And these are the 10 resulting subsurfaces. And so every player essentially decomposes into a weighted combination of these 10 subsurfaces. And so let me just show you a few. So uh, LeBron James, for instance, shoots from many different areas. He's sort of roughly equally weighted across the various components. Tyson Chandler and Brooke Lopez, in contrast, are big guys that stand out in the net. They have all their weighting on um, the sort of close to the net. James Harden, second from the bottom there. Uh, he has this sort of uh, split game where he takes 34% uh, of his shots right at the basket and 26% from long range three pointers. And Steve Novak at the very bottom is essentially loading entirely onto the three point bases. So this, this gives us, we have these intuitive thoughts about how players shoot. And so this, this gives us a numerical way of capturing that. You can imagine doing uh, clustering or something on this data. But more importantly than that, it gives us a really nice way uh, of characterizing the court. Now remember that we haven't told the model that that these are the three-point shots, we want mid-range shots. This is taking the raw data, not telling it that it's the game of basketball, and this is what it spits out, okay? So this is a completely data-informed decomposition of the court. We're not tuning that at all, it's just raw output from the, from the decomposition. Okay, so I'm gonna show you in one slide what the results look like, and it's preliminary, so it's kind of crude R um, plot, but here's what it looks like. So, Dwight Howard, this, so this is, this is actually, from the model that I showed before, this is sort of the inhibition coefficient. So this is how spatially a player uh, inhibits uh, frequency. So let me be clear here, this isn't their ability to stop, if you, given you take a shot, the probability of it going in. This is inhibiting shots from being taken, okay? And so blue here means you're inhibiting shots, red here means you're actually encouraging shots relative to the league norm. So Dwight Howard here uh, around the net is actually doing a really good job of inhibiting shots. And in fact, there's been papers about him by my colleague Kirk, who I mentioned before, that Dwight Howard is one of the best defenders in the league in the paint, so which is right under the net. So he's, he's very good at inhibiting shots, but he's not very good, as you can see, at sort of slightly long range two point shots. He's not very good at defending those shots, likely due to sort of his uh, speed. Jimmy Butler, on the other hand, sort of uh, inhibits quite well in, in the interior. And, J and LeBron James seems to be sort of uh, average overall, but he actually does a really good job of inhibiting three-point shots. So if, if he's guarding a man who's in three-point range, they're much less likely to take a shot than if they were guarded by anyone else in the league. Okay, that's what this is saying. Okay, so we talked a bit about spatial defense. Again, that works ongoing. Uh, as well. I'm going to talk briefly about instantaneous decision making, and I'm going to be really brief about that. Uh, the main reason is that this is part of the Sloan competition this year. It's in one of the finalists, so we're, uh, I'll just sort of skip some of the stuff but show you some of the results. So I know for a fact that we have some chess players in the room, so I'm going to, I'm going to give this analogy here. So there's this, uh, it's called the Immortal Game, uh, which Wikipedia tells me. Um, and it was Anderson versus Kizaritsky in 1851. And so what can you learn from this? Uh, it's, it's sort of the, the chart of the game. All that you can learn was that white won by moving a bishop to e7, checkmate. Okay. So this is how they show highlights on the sports reel at night, right? They show the dunk, they show the three-point shot, they show, they show the touchdown in football, right? That's not what matters. What mattered is the key pass that happened two seconds earlier. What matters is, is that, that moment when the wide receiver lost his man down the field. What matters is that, that no-look pass that sort of set up the, the play. And so in this game, it, it just so happens that there's a critical event that happened early on kind of called the King's Gambit, and, and much of this game was determined very, very early on, okay, due to key, uh, key moments from these uh, particular players. And so the game wasn't decided in move 23, 
Uh, I, I would say it arguably wasn't completely decided earlier on either, but at a given, at any point on this, this, this uh, um, chart, I think anyone who's an expert in chess could probably look at the board and say, well, most likely this person's gonna win or this person's gonna win. It's the same, this, the same idea that you, if you're watching a football game and you're sort of sitting on the, on the couch and you see the, uh, a wide receiver break his man, all of a sudden you're on the edge of your seat because you know, you know that even though a point hasn't been scored, a touchdown hasn't been made, that this is all of a sudden a really high probability uh, outcome or a high expected uh, outcome. We expect a touchdown or something good to happen. So what we, what we think about then is, is, is something that our minds inherently do when we watch sports, is that we think about for a given play what the expected possession value is. In other words, at any instantaneous moment on the court, can we value what the expected number of points is at the end of that possession? What, what would that give us? So that would give us when and how the value was created during the possession. It would tell us uh, who created the value and it would tell us uh, um, who made those decisions. So let me just give you two plots that are gonna sort of encapsulate this. So this is a, a plot which shows a, a given a current uh, scenario. So what we have here is Kawhi Leonard, number two there at the top, he has the ball. And so the, the, I'm not gonna show you the models or anything that went into this, just sort of the results, which can hopefully give you a glimpse of how powerful this is. Um, so he has the ball, the current expected point value is 0.88. If he shoots here, there's a 29% probability that he shoots, and if he takes the shot, he has about a, a expected possession value, if he takes the shot, is 0.68, which is, which is because he has a 34% chance of making that shot, and it's a two-point shot. Okay. His change in EPV is minus two, so that's actually, if he, if he takes the shot, he's actually hurting the value of the play. His best outcome is to pass to Danny Green down here on the right. It's 29% chance he does that. Uh, the EPV after the pass is 1.08 because Danny Green is, is a roughly 33% uh, um, um, three-point shooter and he has a wide open corner three-point shot, which are one of the best um, possible shots in the league. So this kind of, the, the, we have these like uh, models all behind this, but in, in the end what we end up with is these, uh, at any instantaneous moment we can see what the expected possession value is, as well as um, evaluate what that would be at after any change in the, in the possession. Oh. So here's, here's a, an example of a live play. Ideally, this would be a video, but unfortunately, it's just a, a picture. So here on the, this, so what you're seeing here is six courts, and that's the play. So it starts on the top left, goes across the row, and then goes to the bottom row and moves across. And on the bottom, across here, is I'm plotting the expected possession value. Okay, so let me walk you through this. So on the top left here, um, Tony Parker, number nine, has the ball, and he's way outside the three-point line. And his teammate there, 21, who's uh, Tim Duncan, sets a screen, and then from between number one and two, Tony Parker actually goes around and goes into the paint. So that's the, we're at the blue uh, circle now in the top of the middle. At that point, his, the expected possession value, if you look at the bottom, goes from about, uh, what is it there, 0.86 to 0.99. In other words, it's a, he's getting closer to the net. This is good. As we get to court number three, it goes even higher, he's getting into the restricted area, he's getting close to the basket, he's got momentum going towards the basket. The only thing probably hurting him is that player 40 there is right in his face. That'd be probably the only thing that's counting against him. He has an expected possession value at that point of 1.36. Then the magic happens. In the second row,